God didn't give us the Bible for our information. He gave us the Bible for our transformation so that we will be impacted and changed to look more and more like Jesus every day. Who is the Bible for? Is it for pastors and biblical scholars? No, the Bible is for you. In fact, the Bible is a love letter to you. Good morning. It's such an honor to be here with you this morning. I'm so thankful for Pastor Ed and Lisa who have uh, mentored me all of these years, who have been a blessing to our family. And I'm thankful to have pastors that are committed to speaking the word of God and standing firm on his truth, aren't you? I love gifts, any kind of gift, birthday gifts, Christmas gifts, just because I'm thinking of you gifts, I'll take any kind of gift anytime. The first gift, one of the first gifts that I ever received, I received before I was even born. It was waiting in the nursery when I got home from the hospital and it was this Bible. It used to be pink and it has my name engraved on it. I don't know who gave it to me, but I had it since before I was born. And for my childhood, I would take my Bible with me to church. As I got older, my parents would tell me stories from the Bible. When I became a teenager, I would underline verses that I really liked in the Bible. And during all of those years, I was taught that the Bible is God's word. And I never questioned that because everybody I knew believed that. The people that I trusted most believed that. And so I lived by blind faith. I believed just because. And then I went to college. And when I got to college, I met people who were very nice and very smart. And they didn't believe that the Bible was God's word. And for the first time, I began to question that. I began to doubt whether what I had been told was actually the truth. Pastor Ed often tells us that we are to feed our faith and doubt our doubts. And so I began that process. Instead of just sitting there with my questions and my doubts, I began to study and learn so I could answer those questions. And what God did during that season in my life is he moved me from blind faith to reasonable faith. And reasonable faith is where we believe because of the evidence, where we have enough evidence that it would take more faith not to believe than it would to actually believe. You know, we live a lot of life with reasonable faith. Right now, I'm living with reasonable faith. I believe that this stage is gonna hold me up. Now, I've never been under this stage, so I've never looked to see exactly how it's structured, if it's truly solid. I didn't meet the people who built this stage. I don't know what their qualifications are, if they had any idea what they were doing. But I've been sitting in these seats for over 20 years, watching people stand on this stage, jump on this stage, dance on this stage, and no one has ever fallen through. So I have reasonable faith to believe that today it's gonna hold me up. Not certainty, but reasonable faith. Well, what I'd like to do today as we look at the doctrine of Scripture is we're going to look at some big questions about the Bible. And I hope through this process that if you have questions right now, if you have doubts, that this will help to give you evidence, to give you reasonable faith. The first question we want to answer is, what is the Bible exactly? Some of you may be here and you've never even owned a Bible. The Bible is made up, it's a book that's made up of 66 books. Uh, These books are um, different kinds of literature. Some of them are letters. Some of them are historical narratives. Some are poetry. Some are genealogies. And as you take all of these books together, they make up the Bible. Now, this is pretty amazing. The Bible was not written just by one individual or two individuals. It was written by 40 different authors over a 1,600-year period. It was written in three different languages from people from three different continents. Yet when you pull all of these books together, they tell one unfolding story about God and his relationship with a man, Adam. And then as you continue through the book of Genesis, you see his relationship with a family, the family of Abraham, that then grew and became a nation, the nation of Israel. And then you see how God not only relates to that nation, but then as we go into the New Testament, we see that God wants to have a relationship with the entire world through Jesus Christ. 
And then we see that one day Jesus is gonna return again and he's gonna restore his relationship with all of creation as we read in the book of Revelation. So the Bible is one unfolding story. What we're gonna look at today is what are some of the things that we believe about the Bible? What does the Bible say that it is? I wanna give you three statements. Three statements that are a part of our doctrine, our statement of faith here at Fellowship Church. The first is this, the Bible is inspired by God, so it is true without any mixture of error. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible is inspired by God. Two weeks ago, we talked about the doctrine of God and we talked about some of the attributes of God. And one of those attributes is that he is truth. So if God is truth and he inspired the words of scripture, then we can trust that they are also true and without error. Another thing that we believe is that the Bible is God's word to all people, written by human authors under the supernatural guidance of the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21 says, no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. God used men to pen the words of scripture. He used their personalities, their words, but he was the one who was inspiring them, speaking through them through the Holy Spirit on what to write. The third is the Bible is the supreme source of truth for Christian beliefs and living. The Bible is our plumb line. It's our foundation. It's our measuring stick by which we measure any philosophy, theory, opinion, feeling. We measure all of those against what does God's word say because that is truth. Psalm 119, 160 says, all your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. They were true when the Bible was written and they are true today. They are eternal. So these are three statements of what we believe about the Bible. Now, as I begin this journey, obviously I'm not gonna say, well, if the Bible says it's true, then it's true. So I started looking for what evidence is there to support what the Bible says about itself. And one of the things I was curious about is how did the Bible even come to be those 66 books? Who decided that? There's a lot of popular literature now that will say that there was one person or there was a group of people who sat down and decided that these books would be in the Bible. And that's actually not true. It was actually a process that has spanned centuries. Century after century, there have been Jewish scholars and rabbis, early Christians who affirmed the, the books that were specifically words of God that were part of the Bible. I'm gonna highlight a couple of highlights from that journey. The Old Testament... The first 39 books of the Bible were written before Jesus was on earth. So when Jesus was here, the one that we believe to be our savior, the son of God, when he was here, what he referred to as scripture was the Old Testament. The Old Testament was recognized by Jesus as God's word. Jesus affirms the Old Testament. He used it when he was tempted by Satan to fight back against Satan. Throughout his ministry, he quoted the Old, Old Testament as authority. In Matthew chapter five, verse 17, he said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. When he refers to the law and the prophets, he's talking about the Old Testament. So he was saying, I didn't come to wipe that out because it's just literature. He said, I came to fulfill it because it's God's word and it's now coming true. So the Old Testament was recognized by Jesus as God's word. Now the New Testament was written after Jesus was crucified and rose again and then returned to heaven. So when the New Testament was here, he was not on earth, but the New Testament was recognized by the early church as God's word. And that early church was led by his apostles, those who had walked with him, who had learned from him, who had witnessed his resurrection. And so they affirmed God's word. By 397 AD, the books of the Bible as we have them today were already widely accepted by Christians across the board as being God's word. And there were throughout time, there were people who would affirm that over and over again. And finally it was affirmed in 1546 when the canon of the Bible was formally affirmed by the Council of Trent. 
Now, why did they take the time to affirm something that everyone already believed? Well, it's because at that time there were heresies that were being taught about scripture, about God, and specifically about Jesus. And so they wanted to make it very clear which of the books of the Bible have gone through criteria so that we feel very confident that this is from God. But not only that, what they were saying is these are the books of the Bible that are from God that we are willing to die for because they were willing to put their lives on the line to protect these books. There were other books that were written and if there was any question about it, they tossed them out. They only kept the books that they were confident were God's word. Now, all that's great, but I'm the kind of person that I don't believe things because other people believe it. I wanna know for myself. And so I wanted to understand why is it that they believe that the Bible is God's word? Why are they so confident? And so there are four reasons that I wanna give you this morning of why we can be confident that the Bible is the word of God. And it started by me looking at my own Bible and thinking, okay, here's my Bible that's written in English. How can I be confident that my Bible is the same Bible as the ones that were written thousands of years ago? I mean, come on. For most of that time, the copies of the Bible were made by hand. People would hand copy these manuscripts over and over throughout the centuries. Are you going to tell me that there are no mistakes? That somebody didn't just leave out a whole chunk inadvertently? That someone didn't read it one time and go, you know, I don't really believe that part. I don't like what that says. I'm just gonna cut that out. How can we be confident that what we have today reflects the original manuscripts? To do that, we need science because we believe that the Bible is authentic. That what we have today is true to what was originally written. And we use a science called textual criticism. Textual criticism is where you take ancient manuscripts and you compare the copies. And if you compare all of the copies and they're the same, then you can be confident that they are the same as the original. Most scholars will say that if we have a piece of ancient literature and we have 10 manuscripts that are all the same, we can be confident, very confident, that they reflect the original. In fact, there's a book that has a lot of evidence. It's a book called The Iliad by Homer. There are over 650 manuscripts for this one piece of literature. And because of that, no one questions whether this is true to the original. So what about the Bible? There is no other ancient document that has greater manuscript evidence than the Bible, which has 18,000 partial and complete manuscripts of the Old Testament and 24,000 partial and complete manuscripts of the New Testament. Some of those manuscripts date back to 250 BC. We have them from 500 AD. We have them from 120 AD. We have throughout the centuries, we have manuscripts. And when we compare all of those to the manuscripts that we translate our Bible from, they're all the same. So we can be confident that the Bible is authentic. Now that's all great. But what if the original wasn't true? What if the original was inaccurate? That would just mean that we have a bunch of inaccurate copies. So how can we be confident that the original is actually true? In other words, how can we be sure that the Bible is historically accurate? And the way we can be confident of that is again, science. We can look at archeology span to see is what the Bible say throughout history, do we have evidence of that elsewhere? And there is no archeological discovery that has ever contradicted scripture. Not only that, but over time, archeological discoveries continue to confirm scripture. The more and more we discover, the more and more it confirms scripture. There's so many examples of that, I'm gonna give you one. There was a civilization talked about in the Bible called the Hittites. And for years, there were scholars who would argue that the Bible wasn't accurate because there was no other evidence of this civilization until the late 1800s, when in Turkey and Syria, archeologists discovered for the first time evidence of the Hittite empire outside of scripture. And that has happened over and over again. So we can be confident that the Bible is historically accurate. Now it's one thing to say that the Bible is a historical book. 
it's a whole nother ball game to say that the Bible is actually the word of God. So how can we be so confident of that? The reason that we can be confident is because of prophecy that has been fulfilled. We can be confident that the Bible is authored by God and it's because of prophecy. Now, when I say prophecy, I'm not talking about a fortune cookie kind of prophecy. You know, tomorrow you will have success. It's not that kind of prophecy. It's specific prophecy. It lists names and dates and times and locations. Let me give you one example of many of prophecy that's been fulfilled. There are over 300 messianic prophecies. That's prophecies about a coming Messiah in the Old Testament that are fulfilled by Jesus in the New Testament. Over 300. Now you may think, you know, that's just a, that could just be a really big coincidence. Maybe it was just a fluke, a stroke of good luck. Mathematicians have figured the odds of one man accidentally, just by chance, fulfilling eight of those prophecies is one out of 10 to the 17th power. That's 10 with 17 zeros behind it. Now that's a really big number that's hard for me to get my head around. So let me paint the picture for you. I want you to imagine that we take a bunch of quarters, so many quarters that we cover the state of Texas two feet deep. And I take a red Sharpie and I mark one of those quarters with a red Sharpie. And then I come to this section and I have one of you who trusts me enough to allow me to blindfold you and I blindfold you and I take you outside and we load you into a helicopter. And then we take you and we fly you in that helicopter all over the state of Texas. And then I push you out with a parachute (laughs) and you land. And from the helicopter, I shout to you, keep your blindfold on and just go around and try and see if you can find that one red quarter. The odds of you with your blindfold on being able to find that one red quarter is one out of 10 to the 17th power. The same odds of one man fulfilling eight prophecies and Jesus fulfills over 300. We can be confident that the Bible is authored by God because of fulfilled prophecy. Now I've given you some intellectual reasons of why I believe that the Bible is God's word, why it's reasonable to believe that. But I wanna give you a final reason that gives me certainty, and that is this. The Bible is alive and active. The reason I am so confident that the Bible is God's word is because of my experience. I've read a lot of books in my day. I've read some that I chose. I've read many that others chose for me. But in all those books that I've read, and some really great ones that had really great insights, there's never been a book that speaks to me like the Bible. And I don't mean just to my mind. God uses it to speak to our spirits. There have been times that I will sit down and I'm facing a situation or a challenge or a question that I don't know how to answer. I don't know what to do. And I will begin to read scripture and it's like the words jump off the page. And that is God through his spirit speaking. There have been times that I've questioned who I am, what my purpose is. There's been times that I've questioned who God is. When I've been going through situations where I wonder, is he even really here? And as I read my Bible, God speaks through his word and he speaks to my heart and he gives me confidence and he gives me peace and he gives me direction. God gave us the Bible to transform our lives. We see that in scripture. We can look at the 12 disciples. The 12 disciples, when we read the story of their lives, we see that when Jesus was arrested and crucified, these 12 disciples who had walked with him, they doubted him, they denied him, they were scared out of their minds. They didn't know where to go. When he died, they were completely lost. They went into hiding because they were so afraid for their lives. And then Jesus came back to life. And when they saw him, And they saw that all of the words of the Old Testament that they had read were now coming to fruition. It transformed them. And they moved from being cowards to being men of courage who now lived with vision and purpose, who were bold in their faith, who were not afraid to speak up, who were willing to risk their very lives. And most of them gave their life, protecting God's word and telling people about who Jesus was. They were transformed 
because of his word. They, because they were transformed, shared scripture and their stories with others who then shared scripture and their stories with others. And it continued century after century, generation after generation, until one day somebody came and shared scripture and their story with me. And my life was transformed because of God speaking through his word. You know, it's often said that the Bible is the only book you will ever read where the author is always present with you. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12 says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. God gave us his word so that we would be transformed. The greatest proof of the Bible's power is the endless stories of transformed lives. Right now, you are sitting around people who could share their stories with you of how God has spoken to them through his word. So the final question that we need to answer is who is the Bible for? Is it for pastors and biblical scholars? And the answer is the Bible is God's love letter to you. It's not just a book of prophecy. It's not just a historical book. It's not just an ancient manuscript. More importantly, it is God's love letter to you. When you read a love letter, you don't just scan it and toss it aside like a newspaper, if you remember what it's like to read a newspaper. When we read a love letter, we savor it. We read it, and then we think about it, and then we read it again, and then we soak it in because we know its message is so important, and it comes from someone who loves us. That's what the Bible is. God gave you the Bible because he wants to walk with you through life. He doesn't want you to have to guess who he is and what he wants for you and what he came to do in your life. He gave it to us with purpose. But sometimes, let's be frank, we can open the books of the, the pages of the Bible and read and go, I have no idea what that means. And I have no idea how that is supposed to help me in this job situation that I'm dealing with, in this relationship struggle that I'm dealing with, in this doubt that I have. So I wanna give you three quick things so that when you study the Bible, you can go pro. And the first one is P, to pray. When you sit down, first pray and ask God to open your eyes and open your heart and help you to understand. John chapter 14, verse 26. Jesus was speaking and he said, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. The Holy Spirit came to teach us and to remind us of what God has said in his word. And so there are times when I will be facing a situation and I will pray and say, God, I don't know what to do. And God will bring scripture to my mind. And that's how he directs my path. First, we pray so that God will help us to understand and to apply his word. The second is we need to read. We have to actually read it. Your life is not gonna be transformed by carrying your Bible into church because you put it on your nightstand and sleep by it every night. We actually have to open the pages and read it. I would suggest to you, if you wanna start reading, to start with the book of John. It's in the New Testament, the second half of the Bible, and it tells about the life of Jesus. Or you can read the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, it's great. It has 31 chapters, so you can read it in a month if you read one chapter a day. And it has great words of wisdom that are so easy to apply to life. And you are doing something right now that will help you as you read the Bible. Come to church because we have a pastor that is committed to teaching us scripture every single week and helping us to see how do we apply it to our lives? How do I live this out when I walk out these doors and go to my life? We are so blessed. Take advantage of this opportunity. You can also be a part of one of our Bible study classes. In our Bible studies classes, we walk through books of the Bible, a great way to learn scripture. Or be a part of one of our small groups. We have connect groups. We're about to launch some master life groups, which are great ways to better understand the Bible and to learn how can I live in this relationship with God so that I can experience all the things that I hear people talk about. So read his word. And then finally, O is obey it. 
We have to be willing to obey his word because the Bible is not for our information, it's for our transformation. And the way we experience transformation is through application. It's by taking scripture and saying, this is the direction I'm going, but I'm gonna realign my life and I'm gonna change course so that I'm walking where God is leading me. It's obeying his word. You know, the Bible, as we said at the beginning, is one unfolding story. But this story isn't just any story. It's a love story. And it's a love story, not that we just read about from the past. It's a love story that we're a part of. Because in scripture, God says that he created us with a purpose and that he created us and wants to have a relationship with us because he loves us. But scripture also tells us that because of our sin, we are separated from God. But he loved us so much that even though we sinned against him, he chose to send his son Jesus to die on the cross. And then he was raised again so that he came back to life, not only showing that he was who he said he was, but also showing that he was greater than death. And he took on the punishment we, were, we deserved so that we could be forgiven. And scripture tells us that we can have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ if we will A, admit that we're sinners, B, believe that Jesus died and then rose again, and C, choose to turn from our sin and turn to Jesus and commit to following Him. Because you see, we don't have the Bible just because God wants us to have all the answers. We have the Bible because He wants us to know Him, the one who knows all the answers. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And Father, forgive me, forgive us for taking your word for granted, for allowing it to just sit on our nightstand or sit in the back seat of the car or gather dust on a shelf. When there have been people throughout the centuries who understood that this was your word and they were willing to die for it. Father, I thank you that we live in a country where we don't have to be afraid of owning your word and reading it. But Father, let's not just, let us not just stop there, but truly soak it in. Father, I ask that through your spirit, you will use it to transform us, to empower us, to motivate us, to have the same boldness, the same conviction, the same vision and drive as those early disciples did to share you with the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hi guys, thank you so much for watching the Ed Young YouTube channel. That's right, and if you wanna be inspired, encouraged, and challenged like never before, subscribe and click the notification button. We believe this channel can help change your lives. 